So we're going to start our next section uh, today. So far in this class, we've talked about uh, the history of communication, how it got to where it is today. We've also looked a little bit at uh, media organizations and institutions. Um, and one thing we've also touched upon is that circular relationship between society and the different types of, of media that uh, exist in our world. We're going to explore that a little more closely uh, over the next few weeks. So we're going to start today by asking a, a, a question. Uh, who can tell me what does ideology mean? Who can give me an explanation of ideology? Anybody? What does it mean to you? It's a word we hear all the time. What does it typically mean to you, the term ideology? Yeah? Supposedly it's like an idea that a person or a group of people encompass. A little bit louder? Yes. It's an idea that a person or a group of people encompass, and it's essentially maybe like a theory almost. So, you, so basically it sounds like something that something people share. Yeah. OK, yeah. System of beliefs, yeah, was that what you were going to say too? Yeah. Yeah, essentially it is a belief system. Uh, it can be a complicated term though because uh, sometimes in this day and age when we talk about somebody uh, having an ideology or, or an ideological point of view, we don't always mean it as a compliment. Sometimes, uh, particularly if you look in the context of politics and we talk about ideology, uh, uh, people uh, talk about somebody being ideologically rigid and, uh, and immovable. But essentially, it just refers to a belief system, a point of view, if you were. So um, for the purpose of this class and our examination of mass media, I will define ideology as the following, as a system of meaning that helps define and explain the world in which we live and makes value judgments about that world. I'll say that one more time. A system of meaning that helps define and explain the world in which we live and makes value judgments about that world. So in the context of uh, mass media, where might you find ideological messages? Give me some examples of where you might find ideological messages. Yeah. It has to do with what? Are you talking, well, we're talking about mass media, so are you talking about programming um, or uh, so religious programming? Yeah. Okay, yeah, what else? Political news. Political news, yeah, it, absolutely. Um, and particularly, we've talked about 24-hour uh, cable news and how we definitely see, see different ideological messages coming through depending on who you're watching. Where else? Anything else the where we'd find ideological messages? What about, I mean, if, let's just use an example of a situation comedy. Would you find ideological messages in a situation comedy? What do you think? Yes or no? No thought on that? Have you ever seen a situation comedy that ever had a point of view expressed in it? Subtly or, yeah, give me an example of something you've seen and it could be subtle, it could be very blatant, but uh, something you've seen either in an episode or just the structure of the characters that in a sense is promoting an ideological point of view. Can anybody think of any examples? Yeah. Like an episode of American Dad. Mm -hmm. American Dad, give me an example. Okay, that's, that's a good example. What else? Let's, how about uh, one of the more popular shows over the past several years, Modern Family? Do you see any ideological points of view in that show? And if so, what? What, what are some of the ideological points of view you might see in Modern Family? What, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
You were you gonna what were you gonna say? I was gonna say along the same lines about like the whole like gay rights movement. Like mm -hmm. I think that show is kind of one of the main ones about like having an openly gay couple mm -hmm. or family team. Yeah. Yeah, and because there are lots of different, as was mentioned before, lots of different relationship dynamics within that show, they're not blatantly all the time. They have had episodes where they've dealt with the specific issue, like you mentioned, the legalization of gay marriage, but there are messages all the time about this is normal, this is a normal family, even though it doesn't represent our previous conceptions of, of what a family would be. So you, you can make that argument, yeah. Um, I've been seeing a lot of videos of Yeah, which brings me to another uh, point. Uh, advertisements. Do advertisements have ideological messages? Consumerism and materialism. What's that? Consumerism and materialism. Yeah, that's certainly one. Uh, obviously, they're trying to sell you something, so that's, that's one that's right up front. You need to buy this and your life will be better. That's, that's certainly one. What other kind of ideological messages might we find in commercials? See, I think they, they tell us a lot about where we are as a society, and, and, and even sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly, but you can definitely take away some things. I want to play you, for instance, a couple of commercials from the early 60s. Uh, if you could uh, flip that light over there behind you. What can you deduce from that in terms of what, what is acceptable in society and what, what is considered a societal norm? ideologically speaking. What can you deduce from that commercial? Multiple things again, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very similar message to the previous commercial. What else? What else are they saying ideologically? Yeah. Men should smoke. Men should smoke, yeah. And by the way, this is a program that is, was watched pretty regularly by children too. So is there anything wrong with letting the children know that the Winston has great tobacco flavor and that it's, it's the preferred cigarette of Fred uh, Flintstone and Barney Rubble? Is there, is there a problem with that? No, absolutely not, because this commercial aired regularly. Can you imagine a cartoon character, other than maybe the kids from South Park, but you know, a cartoon character of that, that is a regular program viewed by children where they had the characters smoking cigarettes? Can you even imagine that happening? Why not? So, so something's changed, hasn't it? Ideologically, we've changed in the last 50 years. And, uh, and this is being reflected in our media. So. That said, that leads to three questions I want you to take a few minutes to answer. Okay, these three questions on the board. To what extent do media messages shape our belief systems? And I want you to think of examples when you answer this question. If you say, oh, I think it does a lot, give me some examples of how you believe media messages shape our belief systems. Conversely, to what extent do belief systems shape media messages. This is talking about that back and forth influence that we refer to in the uh, simplified model of the social world. To what extent do belief systems shape media messages? And try to think of some examples for that as well. And then the third question, are societal values being harmed or helped by the media? In other words, does the media help us uh, have better societal values or do you think it's deteriorating our value systems and, and, and give some examples once again. So go ahead and take a few minutes and answer those questions then we'll break you into small groups to, to share your answers with each other. All right, first of all, um, question one, to what extent do media messages shape our belief systems? Give examples. What, what are some of the answers you can provide me? Do media messages shape our belief systems? What were some of the answers we had? Yeah. Um, I said in like kids shows and like Disney Channel and stuff, they always have like themes and like the ends of their like, mm -hmm. like all the things. So like when kids see that like, oh like my favorite person is like apologizing to their friends or whatever, then I should do the same thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, when I teach media ethics, we, we deal a lot with uh, how children's programming can definitely send ideological messages. Uh, particularly, I've had people, uh, students, write papers about <coughs> some of the messages, particularly in the older uh, Disney movies, that in terms of what women should be like, you know, the fact that maybe they should be expect for somebody to save them and they should look a certain way. So there's a lot of ideological uh, messages there. Uh, conversely, conversely uh, I am suddenly getting reacquainted with children's programming because I have a little two-year-old granddaughter and occasionally when we're uh, taking care of her, we'll ever have a few minutes in front of the uh, PBS uh, cartoons and I notice those are loaded with ideological messages uh, about what's proper behavior in terms of sharing, in terms of uh, being respectful of others, those kind of things. So they're, they're definitely messaging both subtle and very intended. Uh, what are some other examples, some other answers you had for that question, how media might uh, shape our belief systems? Okay, we had, we had a lot of talking, so I know you were sharing answers. Who wants to go? Go ahead, Matt. Well, I mean, pretty much that, we get to like, accept more of what we see. What's that? You begin to like, accept more of what we see in the media. Oh, so you're saying if we see something regularly in the media, then we become more accepting of yeah. that issue. And I think one thing that comes to mind with that statement of yours is, is the uh, gay rights issue, which has made tremendous strides uh, over the last decade or two. Uh, particularly, I mean, amazing amount of strides over just the last 10 years. and. Also during the last 10 years, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in uh, what I would call sympathetic gay characters in television programming and movies. So my question is, do you think those portrayals help uh, people view uh, people who are gay in a different way, people who might have been predisposed to be against the gay lifestyle? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, and just to follow up on that, and I don't know if I've ever mentioned it in this class before, but there was a study that had been done several years ago where they looked at uh, television and movie programming from, I think, around the um, early 60s through the 70s. And in that period of time, they found that um, there were very few gay portrayals in television and movies, and those that were there were essentially, they, they um, were either a villain or they ended up uh, dying or committing suicide. There was clearly um, a diminished and, and stereotypical role for those type of characters, which of course we've seen a huge change in in the years since then. Uh, other other things you might say as examples, yeah. Uh, well, this is like kind of off topic maybe, but um, I think a lot of like music uh, about music and mm. influences um, the way we think. So specifically, I was thinking about rap music, mm -hmm. and like obviously that's a generalization, but like, <coughs> rap music will promote sexist ideas, mm -hmm. or maybe like the normalization of like great culture, because like we talked about that before. So I think especially like children that are listening to it, it or anyone actually listening to it, it can like, affect like our beliefs and our values. So. Yeah. That, that's a great example, especially right now, because there are a lot of conversations going on right now about misogyny and, and rape culture. So it, it, uh, lyrics are a very important thing to look at. On a, a different track, you know, talking about music, I know just uh, in terms of looking at uh, rock and roll, for instance, rock and roll really became the first youth music. And uh, if you look at the development of that music through the 1960s, for instance, um, young people built an entire culture around that music form. And it kind of became the, the soundtrack of their lives. And, they, and there, before that period of time, there was not talk of youth culture. We have mentioned that in class before, that you, know, you go back a, a century and people weren't talking about youth culture, but electronic media gave young people their own music and their own identity. So certainly it had a huge impact on, on societal values. Absolutely. Anything else on that question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, like for example, the um, 
the proactive commercials mm -hmm. that show like celebrities with perfectly clear skin and they want mm -hmm. the hair and they're like, I want like that. But it's not like realistic, everyone breaks out and not everyone has like this perfect hair and glowy skin like that. Yeah, defined looks, defined body types. We see that all the time in media. Certainly that has an influence. Anything else on question one? Okay, well, so let's flip it now then. Uh, question two, to what extent do belief systems shape our media messages? Yeah. Well, I know we've talked about that like, there's the argument certainly that five to six conglomerates own our media, but there's mm -hmm. also the other one where like we own it. Mm -hmm. So in our discussion class when we talked about like the, the article uh, that the girl did about Facebook that like she talked about confirmation bias and think group polarization. Mm -hmm. So when I when idea spreads on somewhere like Facebook, like that kind of platform and people buy into that idea that might already have it, mm -hmm. um, it essentially like becomes more extreme and larger. So that will obviously reach a large amount of people and that could then shape um, what they might believe. Yeah, I think that's a good point. The fact that uh, people more and more are using social media uh, to share their own viewpoints, to, to put a message out there. And when other people jump on board, uh, it can lead to a movement. And so belief systems are shaping what's being talked about uh, in, in the media, certainly. That's, that's a great example. Anything else you can think of in terms of how belief systems shape our media messages? What else do we come up with? Okay, go ahead. Well, I also think about the civil rights movement and mm -hmm. what we watched mm -hmm. um, about the March on Selma when they had that system of beliefs, obviously, mm -hmm. and that was so widespread when they were really into it. Yeah. And that obviously helped the cause. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's another great example. Can anybody else think of any other examples? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that the whole issue of, of uh, substances is a very interesting one because it's, it's so still evolving. I use the example of the, the Flintstones commercial, which of course, uh, that was acceptable when I was a young child, that you could have those kind of uh, commercials on television. Now, you know, since then, many years before you were born, they were banned from television. Uh, but you could still advertise alcohol and it's made to look like you know a, a fun celebration where everybody has a good time uh, but now you're seeing some counterweight to that with uh, some of the uh, anti-alcohol abuse the the drunk driving advertisements you're seeing a lot more of those so that's an evolving position as well marijuana we we have a ballot measure uh, coming up in November, you know, that's, that's something that's being hotly debated in terms of uh, societal values. And, and again, you see these, as we struggle with these uh, values, they do tend to get reflected in, in media, whether it's in a news discussion or the device for a, an episode of a particular show, it, it, it comes up, it definitely does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if there's a sense that people are really interested in a particular thing or something, then, then the media is going to glom onto that and run with it. Yeah, what were you going to say? Um, I think still there's something racist or sexist shows up in like an advertisement or TV show, there's still an uproar. Mm -hmm. Like if uh, the viewers don't like that and they don't accept it, so they still keep their values. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other any other responses to that question? Those are all really good answers. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the name of the movie, but it's like please stop smoking or that. Oh, thank you for yeah, smoking. Thank, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Thank you for mm -hmm. smoking. Where I think there was a part in the movie where it had like um, famous figures from the '50s and '60s that were celebrities, and they had um, like a cigarette in their hand, and it was on a poster. And then there was within the movie, people were trying to get those removed from those ads. Yeah, which really happened. Uh, yeah. That's a great example in that everybody smoked on TV and in the movies in the th 30s, 40s, and 50s. And then once everyone determined smoking is bad for you and addictive, uh, there was actually a movement in the 80s and 90s to eliminate cigarettes from some of these classic images. Um, which I thought was a little over the top, but you know, if you had a, a, a picture of a famous picture of Humphrey Bogart uh, smoking a cigarette, they would airbrush out the cigarette so you wouldn't see it anymore. And uh, 
uh, as I said, I think in that movie, I'm not changing history, I'm improving history, you know. So it, it's, it's uh, th those kind of things happen as well, where we, we actually try to alter past images because we have a different viewpoint now. Uh, anything else? Okay, let's go to number three then. Are societal values being harmed or helped by the media? How'd you come down on this question? Societal values as a whole. Any, any thoughts on that? And we got a great, a great playing out right now in our political world. Um, a great story that continues to develop and, and I'm trying to figure out where that's going to land in terms of the help, harm help column. But go ahead, what were you gonna say? Kind of, kind of trying to create a, a situation where we're all trying to fit the image and, and not be ourselves is what you're saying. Yeah, that, that's a really good example. What else did you come up with for media and it, whether it harms or helps societal <coughs> values? Yeah. Um, it kind of does both because it's a balancing act between, like, on one side of the scale, it's the media showing us what we want to see, and the other side, it's us telling the media what we want to see. Mm -hmm. And so I think. You know, you see the commercials where, like, Dove saying, like, all women are beautiful, and they show the complete range of body types, but then you see the Victoria's Secret commercials, and yeah. you see that one specific body type. So it just, it does both. It can't be either or. So both, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a pretty good answer, too, isn't it? And I, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of, uh, the the infamous uh, uh, Donald Trump Hollywood Access uh, tape that's going out there now and everything that's coming in its wake. Um, I mean, it, it did make you feel like if you watched uh, the debate or have been watching news you know, lately, like you need a shower immediately afterwards because it's just feeling really slimy out there, all the stuff that's being talked about. If you have young children, they, I've actually seen news people in news programs say, if you have young children, you should probably send them out of the room now because we're going to talk about this story, which is unheard of in terms of presidential politics. But on the other hand, I'm wondering what the end result will be, you know, because we, we referenced uh, misogyny and rape culture a few minutes ago. Do you think any good can come out of uh, what is kind of feeling like a little bit like a sleaze fest right now in our presidential campaign? Do you think anything good can come out of that? Uh, the fact that we're being bombarded, I can see a lot of bad things coming out of it, but is there, is there a positive side? Has anybody been following uh, the discussions and, and uh, the talk about uh, these comments and you know past, present, or future? You know what 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 do you think about that in terms of political both political discourse and societal values? Do you, do you do you have any opinion on this at all? I would argue you should <laughs> because this we're we're about to vote in about what twenty six days and uh, yeah. Yeah. And then it changes like how we feel politically and how important we do like how we choose our candidates because it's kinda like left us in between like a rock and a hard place yeah. that we have chosen. Mm -hmm. But I think it kind of like shaped our values and like what we want to see in our yeah, and I hear that answer a lot. I do because, uh, you, like I said, you, you want to go and listen to hear about issues, and then you're hearing about who's got the most, you know, shocking revelation today, as opposed to what are the issues of the day. So, absolutely, that I I see that as a, a harm. I think people are being turned off by the political process uh, in record numbers due to some of the things we've been seeing in this cycle. Um, so do you think there's any, any good that comes out of this? What do you think? Or is it, is it all negative? Yeah. I think overall it's a lot of negative, but there's good and it's that a lot of people are not figuring out what they want. Like, there's a lot of artists coming out and not chosen, and it's all players who wrote a piece about how that actually is not in the thing that's what Trump said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I feel like for the most part, there's been a lot of people that are a little bit of positive. 
Yeah, so it really does tend to be a, a two-sided coin in a lot of uh, situations. I was also thinking about uh, a few years back uh, with the um, uh, suicide of Robin Williams. And I, I felt that in that situation as well, in that watching some of the immediate coverage really, really upset me in that there was this kind of race to see who could get the most salacious details of what happened, you know, the, the mob of cameras outside his home in Tiburon, you know, all the things that were going on that just felt really sleazy to me. On the other side of the coin, I saw a lot of really good stories about uh, depression and about uh, you know, uh, what people go through and, and ways you can seek help, you know, good follow-up stories. So, so again, good and bad uh, came out of that situation and that does tend to be what happens with, with a lot of these situations. So we're gonna talk a little more now about you know, ideology in terms of uh, how it fits into um, our media. You know? and, and it's interesting, by the way, that uh, once again, I mean, because we're in the heat of the home stretch of a presidential campaign, the media is front and center again in, in a lot of the attacks. The left wing media, the right wing media, you know, whoever, depends who's doing the attacking, they're blaming it on one faction of the media uh, or, uh, or another. And, uh, and they're blaming for different reasons. Uh, sometimes oh, it's because they're, they're a fringe group and they've got this website and they're doing this. Other people get upset with, uh, in terms of the mainstream media, with the corporate media. The fact that um, we have certain, uh, certain conditions that our media uh, goes through in terms of providing information where it's not really uh, in-depth information. It's, it's very uh, surfacy, and, and particularly if you watch television news these days, there's a lot of, um, I would say, a lot of heat, but very little light in some of the coverage. Uh, no, no real depth into what's, uh, what's going on. So uh, we're going to talk about some terms now that are from uh, the, uh, uh, we're, we're what we're talking about today, we're getting into chapters uh, 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 five and six. Of, of our textbook reading, and one of the terms that comes up is a dominant ideology. <clears throat> right, dominant ideology. Um, basically, the name implies you know dominance in in a particular ideology, but. Uh, to basically define it, uh, this is dealing with the uh, uh, ideology that is promoting the worldview of the powerful, uh, rich and the powerful, basically. The worldview of the powerful. And this is where corporate uh, media comes into play to a large extent, because this is the concern. If we only have a five or six conglomerates owning most of the media and they control to a, a large degree the kind of messaging that goes out, we're going to be hearing the kind of messaging they approve of. Okay, so that's, that's what would be referred to as, as a dominant ideology. Um, do you think that happens? It, it gets accused a lot in terms of corporate media. Do you, do you think that is an issue? When you think about the media messages you see on television or in the you know, big budget movies, what do you think uh, in terms of, of the messaging? Are, are you getting one kind of message? And, and I'm not talking political messages, I'm just talking in terms of societal values again, ideological uh, messages. How do you feel about that? Oh, just scratching your head, okay. <laughs> you gotta be careful, I might call on you if you scratch your head, yes. Well, what, what do you think about that? Do you think that's a, that, that there, there's some truth that corporations, um, control a lot of uh, messaging that we see? And if so, what might be some examples? What do you think? Yeah. A little, little louder, I can't quite hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and uh, that's a really good point about you know social media and the internet because as we've mentioned several times before, that's the one place where everybody has an equal voice, 
right now, the one place where we can uh, pre uh, present many different uh, points of view. But this is something that gets discussed a lot in terms of media images and media points of view uh, and why people get upset even over uh, entertainment sometimes. Because the, the honest truth is uh, we don't as a society, for instance, read as much as we used to. A, a good example of, of what I'm talking about was several years ago, back in the, I'd say, mid-90s. Uh, there was a movie uh, made by Oliver Stone called JFK. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that on a DVD, but uh, it, was, it was based on a book by a uh, New Orleans uh, prosecutor who believed that the Kennedy assassination was a conspiracy based, you know, based on his true story where he uh, pursued different individuals who he believed were tied into the assassination. A very good movie. I really enjoyed watching. It was very compelling, kind of kept you on the edge of your seat. Um, and um, what happened was, and this might not surprise you, that uh, when they ran surveys with high school students shortly after the film was released in the theaters about what happened to Kennedy, uh, a vast majority of those who responded to the survey basically recited the plot of JFK. Okay which is a problematic thing because as entertaining as I found the movie, I'm also kind of a history buff and I know that there are a lot of holes in that particular prosecutor's theory and it, which is why one of the reasons he never got any convictions. There, there, was, there was a lot of, of the information that he had that really didn't hold up under a harsh light of investigation. So, but that's a telling of history uh, from a director's entertainment point of view. And we see that all the time, don't we? We see movies based on true stories. But they certainly enhance things to make it more entertaining or, or do composite characters or do various other things or, or maybe play fast and loose with certain aspects of the real story. So is that a problem? When we talk about messaging in society and our beliefs or what we think our world is all about, is that a problem when we see things like that, when we see uh, movies that are based on historical events that maybe be playing fast and loose with history or, or is it just entertainment and and you know freedom of artistic choice how do you, how do you feel about that issue yeah well, there was that OJ Simpson TV show. yeah just aired recently mm -hmm. I saw like Oprah interviewed the people that were actually a part of the real case uh -huh. and they were saying how they were kind of offended and um, the TV show really stretched the truth and what actually happened Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously probably to make it more entertaining, right? Because real life isn't nearly as dramatic as a, a two-hour movie. Uh, and so you, you've got to create dialogue. You have to create scenes that never happened, meetings that never happened to, to try to advance the story, make it more interesting. And on one level, like I said, it's entertainment. Um, is that okay, though? I mean, how do you feel about that? It, it, or do, do Hollywood directors, do Hollywood movie makers have a duty to think about um, the impact of what they're doing? And uh, you could apply that also when we talk about ideology. You talk about uh, issues like violence, violence in movies. Is, is, is it up to directors to say, well, you know what? I think there's too much violent content, so I'm going to tone it down. Or is that essentially a restriction of artistic freedom and artistic expression? I mean, it's a good question. How, how do you come down on, on that issue when you talk about uh, some of the things, we, some of the ideological uh, points of view being promoted in movies and uh, whether they're healthy for society or not? Because we've all seen and heard uh, things that we go, wow, I think that's a bad message, or I think that's too violent, or that's, it's too this or too that. What's the answer, and, and, or should there be an answer? Should we just kind of accept that as part of um, a free society? What do you think? Yeah. For directors, I think it's like a restriction of artistic values, or expression, um, because it's not their job to relay a message, it's their job to interpret their vision of whether it's reality, if it's more just make the movie how they want. I mean, people take Batman as too violent mm -hmm. from like um, the movie shooting four-ish years ago. Yeah. I think it's 
just up to the people to decide what they want to see. I mean, we wouldn't be seeing these types of movies if it wasn't what we wanted, if it wasn't what we liked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. What else? Anybody else have any thoughts on that issue uh, in terms of our entertainment? And if, if again, the, the broader question is, should entertainment creators be aware, more aware of what they're putting out and whether it's helpful or harmful for society? Or is that our responsibility? How do you feel about that? Is, should they take a greater responsibility or, is, or are we the ones who need to take a greater responsibility? Yeah. I think like, the individual has a choice to make that decision, but it still changes us whether we want it to or not. Mm -hmm. Because some things are just unavoidable, so it changes us no matter what. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's like kind of up to us because like they're making like these movies for like entertainment. I think sometimes people forget that it's like supposed to be entertainment. Mm -hmm. So like even though it is like there's messages in it, but like if somebody doesn't want to go see like a violent movie, they don't have to. Like nobody's mm -hmm. telling them that they have to go see that. Like. So, and that's why we also have the rating system. Like yeah. We wouldn't have like little kids going to see Batman and it goes too violent. Like, we're not going to teach our, like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I think that's like you put there. So, like, people don't say, like, that entertainment is making people see things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can so having said that, and I, I would tend to agree with that point of view. You know, the, the fact that I think we're always better off when we're uh, doing the uh, regulating ourselves, when we're you know being responsible citizens, responsible parents in terms of what we take in. But uh, having said that, can the media can the media help promote? Um, even in, I'm, I'm talking about entertainment media now, not news. Can entertainment media help promote? healthy discussions and healthy uh, dialogues about, about issues in society, entertainment media. What do you think? And, and if so, had you, can you think of any examples of things you've seen where you felt like, wow, that really delved into uh, a very important topic in an interesting way? What do you think? Certainly don't see a lot of it on television, do you? particularly in the era of reality uh, television, which seems to be the antithesis of anything with social value. Yeah, go ahead. I think Mr. Robot is a really good mm -hmm. show that kind of deciphers like, society. Yeah. yeah, entertainment program. I've only seen an episode or two of it, but I, I would get that kind of uh, vibe off of it, that it, it definitely has a lot of social uh, content in it and a lot of a lot of issues to think about and talk about and very relevant you know for our time any anybody else can think of any programs that would fit that yeah yeah Yeah, a show that's at its heart as a comedy, but just by the characters they introduce and the situations they put in, uh, definitely bring up some discussion points, you know, within people's own families, certainly. Uh, there was a, a program that, that's really, it's really interesting because I, most television, I think you would probably agree, most television uh, tends to be pretty mindless entertainment most of the time. And that, that's pretty much been the way it's been since the beginning. I, I would certainly argue, though, that you still get um, messaging out of that. You still get uh, ideological messages. For instance, if you're watching 1950s era programming, uh, you're going to see a vision of America that may not quite be uh, what it really was. Uh, what, have you ever seen a 50s era sitcom? And if so, what, what do you notice if you, if you ever saw an episode of a 50s or even early 60s era sitcom? What are some common things you notice about those sh kind of shows? What do you notice? Anybody ever seen any of those old shows? The, the, like the Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, the Andy Griffith show, you know, those kind of shows. What do you notice about those kind of shows? 
that you can see. Yeah. Oh, I was going to talk about um, Leave It to Beaver. Yeah. And um, it's interesting because um, they really don't address any issues that were going on at the time. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of a portrayal of like a perfect family. Yeah. Um, like whereas a modern family sort of addresses issues at all. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and to use that example, and that's a show I used to watch again as a little kid, you know, growing up. But it did strike me odd even then that uh, the mother, June Cleaver, um, would be walking around the house all day with a very nice dress and pearl necklace. And I'm thinking, wow, my mom doesn't do that. She's usually in sweatpants or something, you know, when she's uh, walking around the house. But June Cleaver, very, very well kept, you know. And, and they eat dinner in the father's home, and he has his tie on during dinner. And, it's, and everybody's very polite, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. And uh, not anything like the dinner experience I had growing up or the one that I currently preside over, you know, in my own house. Very, very different. Also, and you see these shows, virtually everybody on them is white, right? You know, you, you think that only white people live in this country because that's all you're seeing uh, on these shows. And uh, there's never really any serious controversy that can't be dealt with within a 30 minute time frame. And, that, and that's pretty typical. So you, you tend to think from these things, it's just entertainment, it's just mindless, but it does project a, a vision of America. Now you move to uh, the early 70s, and there was a really uh, a major seismic shift that happened. I, I, I would question whether it had a lasting impact or not, but it definitely had some kind of impact, which was a show was devised in 1970 uh, where the central character of the show was a, a blue collar um, worker in Queens, New York, who was a bigot and, and said, uh, uh, um, racially insensitive things all the time. And you go, okay, well that doesn't sound like that's gonna be a hit show. But what they did is they brought in, they created a family dynamic where his, his daughter's living at home, she marries her uh, new husband who's very liberal, and he moves into the house with them. And so the, many of their episodes were exploring all the big issues of the day from they, this is in early 70s. They talked about gay rights. They talked about attitudes toward women. They talked about uh, racial issues that were confronting the country, particularly when he, uh, 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 the character Archie Bunker has a family move next door that's African American and the whole neighborhood is trying to circulate a petition to not sell the house to them. And so they, they died right into these issues. And what was really crazy about it was it's a comedy, okay? But uh, they, they managed to walk that fine line between uh, comedy and serious social issues, and it became one of those rarest of things, a, a so socially relevant program that was also typically number one in the ratings. So I wanted to uh, show a, a kind of a clip from this show way back from your, your parents' younger days. As you can see, there's some very tense moments there, and you know they, they bring in the comedy at just the right time. But uh, you know, uh, just you know, watching that scene is I just struck. I hadn't seen it in a long time. How how much tension and confrontation over real issues that real Americans were talking about at that time, and it it always this show always sh uh, stood out to me as an example of how even in corporate owned media, you know, this is a network show on CBS that there's still the potential to start dialogues about issues. And so I always appreciate when I, I see some producer now uh, developing a show that deals with issues, deals with real things that people are talking about, people are arguing about in, in a, a, a very real way. So, so it is possible, and, and this, this gets again back to the whole concept of our media and how we, how we use it really does, uh, to a large degree, depend a lot on how we choose to use that media and what issues we decide to promote if we're a media producer, what issues we decide to uh, pay attention to if we're a, a media consumer. So I wanna go through just a, a few more uh, uh, terms now that talk about the theories that have appeared over the years trying to better explain the role that mass media has in our day-to-day -day lives uh, in our, and in our uh, political process. And these are all uh, really interesting theories to, to think about because one, th one thing I think I should point out is when we talk about theories about 
uh, the, the impacts of media in society that I, I don't believe any one theory explains at all uh, why things are the way they are, but we can certainly pull certain things from different theories that, that help explain what's going on. So one of the things I talked about in the reading uh, was something called the uh, hypodermic uh, model. hypodermic model. So what do you think of when, when I, I use the expression uh, hypodermic? What, what does that make you think of? Yeah, like an, yeah, an injection, right? Yeah. So the hypodermic model basically refers to a concept of the media that the media essentially injects a message into the so-called bloodstream of the public. Uh, as an example, something we mentioned during our talk about media history and, and the 1800s, we talked about yellow journalism and uh, the Hearst newspapers uh, encouraging uh, the public to support a war with Spain. Uh, in a sense, you could, you could use the hypodermic model um, in, in relationship to that. They, the Hearst newspapers were writing uh, very inflammatory articles towards Spain and, and distributing them in many of their newspapers and essentially whipping up an enthusiasm among the public to go to war with Spain. So that, that could be called an example of, of the hypodermic model. Uh, think in terms of the documentary that we watched uh, a few weeks back, uh, of Weapons of Mass Deception. Can you see any relationship at all there in terms of, of this particular theory, this particular model, and what happened in the media uh, in terms of the run-up to Iraq? What do you think? Do you think there's any relationship there? What did, what did you see in, in uh, that documentary that might relate to this particular model? Yeah, Jack. I was, yeah, I was going to use 9-11 as an example, and I think that during the footage of you know, the planes going into the Twin Towers over and over again to a point where people were asking the stations to just stop altogether. Yeah. You know, although that occurred, it definitely brought about or further reinforced a sense of unity in America at the time. Mm -hmm. But then as the uh, documentary showed, um, there was a, like an outrageous number that I don't think many people realized um, or percentage of the people in um, Afghanistan um, in Iraq that were children, like 15 and under, mm -hmm. and then they showed the footage of them in the hospital. And not many Americans obviously got to see that because they were too busy watching what was being built up as like an action, you know, adventure kind of scene already. Yeah. The introduction to the broadcast. Right. Yeah. And what they portrayed in that documentary was not uh, that that stations and news outlets were necessarily purposely ignoring uh, some of these things going on, these side stories, but they but there certainly was this kind of fervor among the media, and as, as they mentioned in the documentary, most of the national media is based in New York, so they felt, they felt the impact of 9-11 probably more deeply than even other people around the country. And as, as human beings, when they start hearing, oh, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, they're, they're basically repeating that message out over and over again to the public. And you could argue that in the hypodermic model that then the public was saying, yeah, he's a bad man with bad weapons, he must be stopped. Finding out later that he didn't have all the weapons that we thought he did, but, but this, was the, this was the predominant thought. I think if you had polled Americans at the time of the Iraq invasion, probably between 80 and 90 percent probably would have been, uh, supported the invasion. Uh, that's a pretty significant number of people. Okay, uh, next uh, concept is called the mass society theory. This is an interesting concept uh, uh, to me. Basically, this, uh, this concept is that modern society is characterized by a growing homogenization of the, the population and a decline in interpersonal and group relationships. At its base, the theory is suggesting that the traditional extended family unit is giving way to smaller families and more fragmented social circles. Okay, so essentially what they're saying that this theory argues that mass media plays an important role in unifying society. 
Okay, so let's think about this for an example. Uh, you go back uh, 150 years ago, most people never traveled in terms of, of where they lived, never went more than maybe 50 miles from where they were born. Everybody lived together. This was still, I would argue, was still largely the case even when I was young. Uh, all my grandparents were around, my, most of my great-grandparents, cousins by the dozens, and there were all kinds of family uh, within a couple hour drive of each other. Uh, as our society has changed, we see, we've become a much more mobile society, haven't we? It's not uncommon for any of us to have various uh, close family members in different parts of the country. Uh, we we're tend to be more fragmented, uh, more, a more mobile society. And what this theory is saying is that mass media is something that can pull us all together. And think about that for a second. Uh, for those of you, for instance, who c uh, communicate with friends or relatives via social media, people who don't live here, have you ever talked about, for instance, a great movie you saw or your favorite TV show, the latest episode? Um, it doesn't matter where you live, you have that in common with uh, your friends and relatives in Boston, in, in Atlanta. Anywhere you go, they're watching and talking about the same uh, media entertainment as you are and the same media news stories that you are. So, so this mass society theory is saying that's one of the primary roles of mass media and, and has a great impact because of that. Uh, on the kind of the other end of the uh, scale, there's something uh, kind of other end of the scale, I'd say from a hypodermic model is, is something called the minimal effects model. So, as the name implies, this particular model does not put a lot of stock in media having uh, too dramatic of an impact on our ideology or our worldview. Essentially, um, this model suggests that media messages act to reinforce existing beliefs rather than change opinion. Uh, for instance, the author of this model suggests that things like class, or, or religion are more important than media in explaining a voter behavior. And that when they do surveys, they find that, you know, what's your religious background? What, what's your class background? You know, what, are you from an urban area? Are you from a rural area? All these things tend to shape who we are more so than media. And we've talked about this, that media being part of the socialization process. This, this model says, yeah, but not so much as something that changes your mind is something that might reinforce what you already believe. Yeah? Is this kind of like, like, uh, kind of like keeping it hopeful that older generation believes kind of like what we say, like Yeah, well that would be an example that, that, that uh, a millennial uh, point of view would be different than uh, somebody from a baby boomer generation on certain issues and it's not really necessarily driven by media, but just driven by the experiences you've had growing up. And, and, and so that would certainly be a, a subcategory as well, millennials versus uh, baby boomers, for instance, yeah. Uh, the next one is, I think, a really important concept, particularly as it pertains to the news media. Okay, and this is a term that's used in a lot of different uh, contexts. So uh, in this particular thing, agenda setting. Anybody ever heard that term agenda setting before? Like they use this term in business a lot. You know, we, we have to do some agenda setting. What's our priorities for our business, essentially? Um, in the terms of media, it's, it's essentially talking about the media's ability to direct people's attentions towards certain issues. Okay, so as a former media professional, I did not, and I don't think anybody I ever worked with tried to sway anybody's opinion on a particular issue, like you should believe this or believe that. However, something we did do on a regular basis as we put together our newscast is we practiced agenda setting, meaning if you have a 30 minute newscast and then you take away the commercials, 
take away weather and sports, that's going to leave the typical half hour local newscast with about 18 minutes left. A lot happened in the world today. How am I going to get the entire world into 18 minutes? It's not going to happen, is it? So I've got to make decisions about what do I think are the stories that are either A, the most important stories of the day, or B, the ones you're most interested in. Sometimes those two overlap. But I've got to make these decisions. How do I create a newscast that is serving the public interest in the 18 minutes I have? That's where agenda setting comes into play, okay? Because you can't get everything in, so you have to decide which stories make the cut, which stories don't. Now think about that for a second. Think about it when you're listening to an inordinate amount of time being spent on who said what on a tape, uh, what person did this and that, you know, what scandal broke here or there. Think about all the stories you're not hearing about because you're hearing so much about those stories. That's agenda setting. That's uh, news producers saying, this is what everybody wants to hear. This is how we get so much celebrity uh, news into our newscast these days as well, because they know if a celebrity is going off the rails, a popular celebrity, that people are going to want to know about it. So they put that story in the newscast or in the newspapers. But by doing that, they've now taken up space or time that could have been used on something else. Okay, so. This is why I feel this is one of the most overlooked concepts in media, because it's so important. Uh, put another way, and when somebody discussed uh, agenda setting, it was summed up by saying that the news media may not be successful in telling people what to think, but it is stunningly successful in telling them what to think about. Okay, think about that for a second. So this is the whole purpose. Has anybody ever heard of uh, Project Censored? It's a, it's a program that actually started on this campus. And they, they publish a journal every year. And they also do things like the top 10 junk news stories of the year or the top 10 underreported stories of the year. And the reason these, are, these stories make the list is because of agenda setting. Because people in newsrooms are making decisions about maybe covering something because it's, it's really uh, sensational but ignoring some maybe more deeply important stories in the process. Okay, so then the last theory we're going to uh, discuss today is the political socialization theory. All right, so this particular theory um, argues that the media may be uh, especially strong in the early political socialization of uh, adolescents. For example, they've done research on high school students that show that they rely on mass media more than they do on their families, friends, or teachers in developing attitudes about current events or politics. Now, as I said before, before we introduce these various schools of thought about uh, uh, media influence on ideology, one thing that I, I brought up was that um, I don't think any single theory fully explains the, the whole concept of impact of media. But this is a particularly interesting one to explore with you because this one relates to people your age. And they're arguing that from their studies that your political socialization uh, has been more influenced by media than it has by friends or family. So I want to ask you if you feel it, that is true in your own life or would you disagree with this particular theory? What's, been, what's your experience in terms of your, your political views, your, your ideology, and how much media shaped it versus how much uh, family and friends might have shaped it? How do you feel? You got your viewpoints from someplace. Where, where do you, what do you think were the bigger influences? Was it family, friends, or was it things you were able to access in the media? Yeah. Um, I would agree that I, I feel like my point of view is um, more shaped by 
by the media than friends and family. Mm -hmm. I can't really support this. It's just like what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. But friends and family certainly, people that you admire, you know, their yeah. opinions shape you. But I would say that I. Yeah, so yeah, all these things definitely influence, but you're saying that in your case, the media tips the scale a little more than those other uh, categories. Yeah? You were next, go ahead. I was going to say that exactly. Okay. What were you going to say? Um, I agree. I feel like your family kind of gives you like a base of like morals in a way, like what um, you should believe, I guess, but then with the media, it kind of exposes you to the whole hundreds of other beliefs and other opinions. And like they said, they kind of want the ability to shape your own thoughts. Mm hmm. Um, because they give you the power to have your own thoughts. Mm hmm. Okay, you're next. So what, what were those kind of dynamics that led to that in your situation? Well, growing up, we had a lot of limited access to TV and things like that. Mm -hmm. We had to earn our TV time and ah. stuff. And so it wasn't really until we were much older that we go out to just use media freely. Like, it wasn't until I was in high school that I had access to everything on my own free will. Okay. Right, that you were next. Um, I, I was going to say that I think like one of the biggest influences for like my political sense or like the values that I have is the education that I received, like specifically in high school, mm -hmm. because I think it was very like I received a very like liberal education, and especially like and I think like the teachers really like kind of pushed that onto us, and I'm not in like a negative way, but it was yeah. just, and then like perhaps like not so much like my friends being. Like, like, like trying to convince me of certain things, I was just exposed to a lot of different types of people. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's like where I get my. So I, I don't really think of that mind comes from mass media so much. More from like, your educational experience yeah. is what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. What were you? Um, Yeah, and I should mention, you know, just to, to clarify, you know, the, the, the political part of this, this theory, because uh, I don't think um, this theory argues that in terms of, like, core values that the media has more influence than your parents or your family. Uh, and I think a lot of people would argue that that's their, your family still has a lot to do with your core values. But, but in terms of politics, you know, they're saying that uh, media tends to be a bigger influence for some people. Anybody else have an opinion one way or the other on that particular subject in terms of your, your political ideology and how much you think it was shaped uh, on media access versus uh, the opinions of those that you grew up with? What do you think? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I agree with Emily, but at the same time, I feel like your friends kind of have like a big impact on the way that you think. Because like I don't know, I don't like me personally. Like if I have more like like I don't want like I don't mean this like rude way, but mm -hmm. like feels this way. But like I don't like want to like really put myself around somebody that like has a very like conservative, very like small, closed-minded like point of view on life. You know? mm -hmm. so, Sure. Like racist or something like I don't want to be around that. So I feel like the people that you surround yourselves with mm -hmm. is like something that influences you. Yeah. Um, a lot of my friends have a lot of different widespread views, and I actually enjoy it a lot because I like talking about mm -hmm. it. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I enjoy those kind of discussions. Yeah. Um, something that's interesting that's happening now, though, it, and this kind of relates to this uh, particular theory, is the fact, and we've talked about this in previous classes, the fact that there are so many media sources, non-traditional media sources, uh, to, to give perspective. When I was growing up, uh, you know, all through young adulthood, you, if you wanted national news, you had to, let's for television, you had to watch either ABC, CBS, or NBC, half hour program, right? And the model for those programs is the model that they currently still basically use, which is here's the story, here's the issue, here's what this side says, here's what that side says. And they kind of pre present the information in that straightforward way. Uh, now, though, uh, the audiences for those kind of programs are dying off, and I mean that literally, not figuratively. If you look at the commercials on an evening news show, uh, and they're all for medications, uh, that tells you the age of the uh, audience of network news, right? So your generation, and I would even argue maybe the next generation up from you, are, are not watching television news or not turning to newspapers in near the same numbers that previous generations did. And what's happening now is we're going to different media sources for our information, some highly reliable, some grossly unreliable. And that's creating a whole new dynamic to this model where I would argue it's also leading to maybe some of the deep divisions we're seeing in this country because you're finding, at least I'm finding, that sometimes when I get in a discussion with somebody, I'm finding that we're working with entirely different sets of facts because of depending on where somebody's getting their information. And I think that's also one of the things that we like to stress in not only this class, but in all the classes uh, in the uh, comms department that it really does fall on you as consumers to really vet your new sources. Are they using legitimate information? Are they taking information out of context? And, and, and because uh, I think that the political discussion has gotten very unwieldy because there are so many different uh, websites, so many different uh, radio shows, and again, espousing certain points of view and allowing us to insulate ourselves. If we have a certain set of views, we don't have to be challenged anymore. We can seek out the media that supports uh, what we believe already. So uh, definitely something to think about. Okay, I was going to do this exercise that I'm going to say for next week that it deals directly with agenda setting. What we're going to do uh, next week at the beginning of class is I'm going to have you break into groups and I'm going to essentially have each of your groups uh, using the same source material develop a short newscast and an exercise in agenda setting. What stories do you think should be covered and in what order would you cover them? So we'll do that next week. Also for next week we'll be discussing material from chapters uh, 7 and 8 from our textbook. That's it.